Well, we are now right smack in the middle of a brief sermon series. The title is A Generous God. And we are, we are talking about the fact that, that, that if, if, as Christians, if, if you consider yourself a Christian, which, which by way of review uh, means that not only do you believe the tenets, the teachings of Jesus, but you believe them, meaning that, that you, you follow them. You don't just believe that, that what's the, what the Bible says is actually true, but it's, it's true for you. You are following the ways of Jesus. and You put your faith in Jesus as your, your Savior. If, if, if you are a Christian, then, then what we're really talking about is that over the next few weeks, just, just two more weeks after, after today, in fact, what we're really talking about is that, that God is a generous God, and therefore as his children, we emulate, we we're mirror images of that. He's generous, and so we're like him. So we walk around on this globe, and people are like, wow, you're generous, uh, and you say you follow Christ. You say that you're a child of God. Your daddy must be generous too. Uh, this first few minutes, just, just by way of review, uh, last week I, I, I said it's like that in your home. Parents, if you're generous, if you're a generous dad, if you're a generous mom, and you, you are generous toward your children, then generally speaking, I've just seen it too many times, generally speaking, your kids grow up and they are in fact generous adults. If you are stingy as a parent and your, 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 your children see that, they tend to mirror that image. They tend to grow up and be stingy and fearful like you. Um, so, so, so again, uh, the whole jumping off point for our generosity is that, that our God is an, an extravagantly generous God. And if we are his children, then we are supposed to. It's natural or supernatural, actually, for us to mirror his image. In fact, boy, you, you want to drill down deep theologically. That is really what we are. We're image bearers of God as his children. And so one of those, one aspect of his image is he's generous beyond compare. And we mirror that. The fact is, I, I call it a fact, I believe this is, this is absolutely true. Everyone in this room wants to be known as generous. None of us walks around uh, hoping that people would, would see, see us as, as, as stingy, as tight. Those are words you don't want associated with your name. And, and, yet, and yet, often, often, we struggle. There's this tension. There's this dichotomy. I want to be one way, but all too often, I'm another that's true of, of a number of different areas of our lives, isn't it? Like I said last week, one example would be we all want to be known as humble, but, but none of us want to be known as wrong. Like, I want to be humble, but I never want to be wrong. So there's this tension, there's this dichotomy, and it, it's that way with generosity. I, most of us, I say all of us, we want to be known as generous, but there's a tension. There's a dichotomy. And I believe that the, the, the reason, the source of that is, is fear. There is, this, there is this real fear in our lives at times which, which goes like this. Maybe God really isn't that generous. Uh, maybe, God, maybe God doesn't really have my best interest at heart. And so it plays out like this. If I am generous... I may run out. I may not have enough for myself. So the struggle, the tension to be generous people is born out of this root cause, this, this root sin in our lives called fear. By way of review, what is 
generosity. I, I gave this last week. Um, generosity is showing a readiness to give more of something that is strictly necessary or required. So if it's a tax, it's required. That's not generous. But when you go above and beyond, when someone says to you, oh, you shouldn't have, and, and you think to yourself, well, I didn't have to, but I wanted to. When someone says to you, oh, you didn't need to, and, and you say, I know, I, I know I didn't need to, but I wanted to. I couldn't help myself. It just, it just made me happy. That's, that, that's why there's this tenet within, the, within the, the New Testament that says that God loves cheerful giving. Because that's, that's, it's non-coerced. It's not obligated. It's not mandated. It's not, it's, it's not a tax. It's something that's born out of the heart where you say, I just, I couldn't help myself. Like, I know, I know you, you, get, you get the gift, but, but in you getting the gift, I get so much joy. That's what generosity looks like. It's uncoerced. It's voluntary. Just one more, one more thought, uh, reviewing what we went over last week, because some of you weren't here. Um, we talked about this big, this big uh, church word, stewardship. That we are stewards. Not a word that we throw around unless maybe you, you're, 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 uh, you're on a plane and, and you've got a steward or a stewardess and, and, and they're, they're managing what's going on there. They're, they don't own the plane. They don't own you. They're simply managing what has been put in their care. You're a steward. I'm a steward. Of the th I'm just managing what God has given me. We talked about that last week. A, a, as a Christian, I'm a manager. I'm a manager of all of the resources, and God is the owner. And that, that plays out in several ways that are really beautifully freeing. Um, about 15 years ago, um, through, through no mistake of our own, Lydia and, Lydia and me, um, we had someone who owed us quite a bit of money um, through a business deal. And, and someone owed, this is when I lived somewhere else, and someone owed me quite a bit of money. And, and that person stopped making payment and stopped, just, just kind of went, went, went dark, went quiet. And, and I was, for a short time, kind of worked up about that. And, and, and there was a day where I had this real sense that, that, that God spoke to me and he said, don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. I'm the owner, you're the manager. Don't, don't sweat over it anymore. And that's where this, this uh, truth came into play for me. I, I could say, you know, it's, it's not mine anyway. God has given me all that he has given me as, 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 uh, to, to, to manage, to steward. But it's his anyway. A steward, a manager. Another example would be... Uh, Within, within your little, this little space that you play, you know, the stuff that God has given you and the job that you have and the responsibilities that you have um, as a steward, right? This, this, this space that God has given you to play. I, I, love, I love thinking of life in that way. You know, God has given me this little space to play. Within that space, you have some stuff. I was just thinking about this last night. Uh, so I've got... I've got stuff. You got stuff. I got stuff. That's, that, that can be really good. Sometimes it can, it can, can, we can make too much of it and it can become really bad. But I've got stuff. And, and despite, it's kind of a, a, maybe a silly little example, but like, so I've got, Micro can back me on this. I've, I've got uh, some, some, some dirt bikes that are in various stages of like, uh, operating efficiently. Like some of them run sort of well, some of them not so much. And, and there are, in fact, recently, Mike knows this recently, I've been kind of worried about, like I've got these, these dirt bikes 
that I'm not, I'm not managing stewarding very well. Like, like, like I would say, like, they're just kind of rot, rotting in my, in my uh, garage. Like, I should either get rid of them, which I'm not going to, or, or, or I, should, I should, you know, fix them so they work well. What's going on there in my own heart? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm being a steward. That's a good thing. The stuff, the, the, the junk in your house that you're like, man, I've got to get, get this straight. I've got to get this, got to be more efficient. And I gotta, uh, the stuff that's broken, I've got to fix it. Like everyone, everyone in this room, you've got some of, that, some of that going on in your life. And that's good. That is this innate sense that God has given you that you should manage what he has given you well. You should steward it well. It's crazy to just let your stuff, stuff rot and, and, and just let your stuff waste away and not... not care for it well. Right? That's true in how God has set up creation as well, that we are to steward this earth well. We're not to just slash and burn. We are to be good managers, good stewards of what God has entrusted to us. But the fact is, He owns everything. Now, now notice that this says, this, 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 this ethic or this, this big idea from, from last week, it says that as a Christian, I'm a manager. Now, if you don't claim to follow Christ, um, maybe somebody dragged you here today, or maybe you're contemplating, and you're welcome here, and I'm glad you're here, but, but if, you're, if, you, if you really haven't said, like, I've, I'm, I'm committed, I'm, I'm submitted, I'm, I'm a follower. If you haven't said that, then, then you can, like, you can hold on to all your stuff and you can, you can say that, like, I made it with my own two hands in a Bart Simpson kind of a way, so thank God, thank you God for nothing. Like, my, my parents paid for this or I paid for this. Like, I made it with my own, my own, by the sweat of my own brow. Like, like that's, a, that's a reasonable way to approach life. But that's not a Christian ethic. That's the way the rest of the world probably does Look at their stuff. But that's not a Christian ethic. So today, now new material, today we have two riveting stories from the Bible that I want to explore. Two people who say, and in fact I believe that there's integrity in their words, who say that they want to follow Christ. And that's us, right? Most everyone in this room today, we say, I want to follow Christ. I want that for myself. I want that for my family. I want to live that way for my children because I want my children to be Christ followers. I want that for me, my household. We are going to follow Christ. Well, so two people today, and, and the, one is a story of, of caution. Now, last week I said there's this riveting story, but I ran out of time. I couldn't tell you, so I'm going I'm to tell you this week. One is, one is a story of caution, and it is a riveting story. And the other is, is equally riveting. It's a story of encouragement. So let's jump in and look at these two stories. The first is, is, is uh, someone that we often call a rich, young ruler. I'll read out loud, and you follow along silently. Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. It's kind of a brush off. Jesus is kind of a brush off. But to answer your question, but to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones? The man, we, we know him to be the rich, young ruler. Which ones? Man, I, I'm like this guy. When, when somebody says, you've got to follow the rules, I want to know, like, which ones? Because I don't want to waste my time on any of the, of the secondary requirements. Just, just what is absolutely required? Which ones, the man asked. And Jesus replied, you must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. 
Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. Again, Jesus, this is still just kind of a brush off. He hasn't gotten to the heart of the matter yet. <laughs> the, uh, the man, the rich young ruler, says, uh, I've obeyed all of those commandments. But apparently he's not satisfied because he said, what else? What else must I do? And, and Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, if you want to accomplish what you have asked, eternal life, go and sell all your possessions and give your money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. The word of the Lord, for which I give thanks. The rich young ruler, his, his story is recorded in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke. I believe it's in Mark. We read from Matthew. I believe it's in Mark where, 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 it, where it says that Jesus looked on the man and he loved him. And then he said, here's what you must do. Go and sell your possessions. Give them away. Come and follow me. This, 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 this instruction that Jesus gave um, to the man, it, it was not cold-hearted. Uh, it, it, it was not, it was not um, unkind. It was born out of love. One thing you lack, go and sell and give it away and come and follow me. And you might say, because I've said this too, how harsh. How harsh that Jesus would say, sell it all. Why does he instruct him to sell everything? And I believe the answer you see is this. When Jesus calls you to follow him, you don't just get rid of some of your idols. You're obligated to get rid of all of your idols. So what is this, what is Jesus inviting this man to? This, this is potentially a hotly debated answer. And so if you don't, if you don't, this is what I, I believe. I believe that this, that, that in this case, Jesus is inviting this man to be one of the 12, I suppose I would have been 13 at that point, to be one of his closest confidants, to be one of, one of the chosen few. See, in that day, to be invited to be a student of a respected rabbi, oh, that would make your, your parents proud. Oh, that would potentially set for you a career. At the very least, it was, it was an honored and esteemed position to be invited to and you had to be invited you had to, you couldn't just make your way into the inner circle this was an esteemed opportunity Jesus God's son said come and follow me I believe that this is a very very specific very honoring sort of an invitation Jesus didn't say to the masses, just sell all your stuff and give it all away to the poor. But, but this, this gentleman, he loved him. He looked on him with compassion and he invited him into his inner circle and he said, this one thing you must do. I see this as the only record we have of someone who has turned down this high of an honor. During Jesus' public adult brief in years sort of ministry. So I ask you this question. What opportunities are you perhaps missing in God's kingdom because you're holding so tightly to your stuff? 
Well, if you ask me on a good day, like if Jesus said you could come and follow him around Israel for three years and be his closest confidant, be like in on the action, but all you had to do is like, like let go of the, the death grip you have on your stuff, w would you gladly let go of your stuff and follow him? And, and I, you know, on my good day, I would say, oh yeah, sure I would, but <clears throat> I guess I don't know. Again, I ask, what opportunities are you missing in God's kingdom because you're holding on so tightly to your stuff? And I think on this, what if in an effort to hold on to our stuff, we are missing out on some deeper level of prosperity? That word has become so cheap. What if in an effort to hold on to our stuff, we're missing out on some deeper level of prosperity God actually has in store for us? This is Psalm 1. Have you been memorizing Psalm 1? I invite you to do that. I was going to nervously re recite Psalm 1 to you today. I'm not going to. I think I'll hold off till next week. But, but I've invited you. Let's, whatever translation you want, let's memorize Psalm 1 together over the next few weeks. It's a paraphrase of part of it. We were like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Our leaves never wither, and we prosper in all we do. That's what Psalm 1 says of the righteous man, of the righteous person. He doesn't walk, stand, or sit with, with the ungodly counsel, but instead he delights in the law of the Lord. And as such, he, he, he prospers like a, like a healthy, vibrant tree. That's what God calls us to. And, and what if in an effort to, to hold on to my stuff, because I think in somehow, some way, I can make myself prosperous. What if in that, the sad truth is, I'm missing out on some deeper level of prosperity. You see, you see, we often mistakenly think that God wants to take something from us. God doesn't want to take anything from you. If you today were to say, I'm going to, I'm going to go from being stingy to being generous. I'm going to, be, uh, I'm going to, 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 to open up this like floodgate and I'm going to trust what the Bible says that a generous man will prosper. That he who refreshes others will him, himself be refreshed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that out today. What I want you to know is God, he's not trying to take something from you. He doesn't want something of you. He actually wants to give you something, not take something away. What if an effort to hold on to our stuff, we're actually losing out? It's like a bad transaction. We think it makes sense on paper. But actually what... What God has, all the abundance you have has come from the Heavenly Father. Everything you have, everything you've amassed, accrued, and, and having an abundance of whatever, money in our case, because we live in the 21st century, having an abundance of money, that's not bad. In fact, that's actually, I believe, quite good. That's actually quite good. The difference between having an abundance and, and, and being a greedy person, however, the difference, the only difference between a Christian who lives in abundance and, and, and a foolish person who lives in greed is generosity. It's, it's giving. It's the only difference. Abundance becomes greed the day I stop giving. Abundance becomes greed the day I stop being a generous person. Story number two. Story number two is, is not, a, it's not, a, it's not a cautionary tale. It's a, an encouraging story. goes like this. 
Meanwhile, get my notes here. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in, a, came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. The, the disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste! What a waste, they said. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, replied, Why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing for me? <clears throat> a really oft misunderstood verse here. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered, will be discussed. I know how true. That's what we're doing today. Jesus knew that. This deed that this woman did that day, we're still discussing to this day. So, story number two. Not a story of, of caution, but rather a story of, of encouragement. It takes place in this home, the home of Simon the leper. Now, now you, you probably, if you've spent some time studying the Bible or studying history, you probably have heard of <clears throat> leprosy. This story, this, this, this fact that Jesus is in the home of Simon who previously had leprosy, it says, this is really odd. We, we just kind of read through it and, and just assume that, that, that it's just normal stuff, but it, it's odd that Simon had either, <clears throat> was either completely healed, which it says that he was previously a leper, completely healed, and had gone through all of the, not, not just been healed, but gone through all of the ceremonial rituals such that he's now made his way back into society. He now can have a home. He can now uh, uh, invite people over to his home because it wasn't just a matter of being healed of your leprosy. You had to go through a lot uh, of, of paperwork, um, religious ritual, in order to be cleared, in order to be be able to live a normal life. Again, not be an outcast. So we have Simon the leper. What an odd name. Simon the leper. Uh, he was either healed and, and all better because lepers were outcast and forbidden from hanging around with society. Or perhaps this is another example of Jesus um, and how, how, what, what, what a length he'd gone to uh, to spend time with the unlovely, to spend time with the outcast, <clears throat> to spend time with those that no one else would spend time with. <clears throat> and perhaps th this, this lady, unnamed in this gospel, named in some other gospels, perhaps this lady herself had, 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 had run with other lepers or had had, had leper, leprosy at some point herself or, or whatever. She seems to know the culture of shame. She seems to know the, the culture of being outcast. She seems to know it well. And perhaps this perfume was, was all that she had to her name. In fact, most likely that is true. In the culture of the day, the brutal culture as it was for women in particular, the fact that she has something of value is a bit strange. The, the likelihood that it's the only thing she had is, uh, is probable. Um, perhaps this is all that she'd owned. Perhaps it had been handed down from, 
from, from, from family member to family member. Think on this, and it doesn't, doesn't say this, but, but, but perhaps, perhaps she'd, she'd been given it, uh, perhaps her daddy had given it to her. Even if she was an outcast, she was running with lepers, she was lum- running with, with healed lepers, and, and perhaps her daddy said, look, 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 you're still my little girl. Perhaps it was some kind of anointment, some, something to, 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 to cover a smell. Her daddy loved her even still. We don't, we don't know for sure, but what we, what we do know, what we do know is that we have a woman living close to a leprosy camp. There, there's some... There's some, um, there's some evidence that this, this city, Bethany, this city was, was formerly a, a leprosy camp. What we do know is that we, we have a lady who's living close to lepers, uh, and, 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 and she, she has a very extravagant gift. Um, according to another gospel, uh, the gospel of Mark, it was a year's worth of wages. So think on that. Think on an ointment, a uh, perfume that, I don't know, is, is, is 40, 50, 80, whatever, thousand dollars. And she is willing to waste it on Jesus. And that's what they say. Why such a waste? A year's wages. Why such a, a waste? Big idea number two today is this. My view of waste and God's view of waste are not the same. My view of waste and God's view of waste are not the same. In both of these stories that we've looked at today, in both of these stories that we looked at today, our human view of waste and God's view of waste are quite different. I think it's a waste when I give it away. God considers it a waste when I hoard it and keep it and, and hide it and count it at night. And you know you do. You go online and you count it. I, I, it was maybe a year ago. It's a year ago. I, I, uh, I've been saving money all year. That's not, that's not what I meant to say. I, a year ago, I pulled this can out. Remember this? And I said, I, I grew up kind of hick. Uh, I mean, I grew up in Brownsville, but, but I used to hear this, 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 this like rhyme or saying. It's got money in it. And that was, remember how it goes? It says you, um, it's an old school saying. And that, that, that here's what we're trying to do in life. We're trying, we're trying to, to, to get all we can and can all we get and then, and then sit on the lid. I'm not going to sit on it because that would look odd. But, but that's how we live. Like we, I'm going to get all I can and can all I get and then I'm going to sit on the lid. And, and God says, that's a waste. And it does seem kind of like a silly picture when you really think about it, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I spoke briefly about my dad last week. My dad was one of, one of the most generous men that I've, I've ever known. And... Um, he would, um, he would give 10% and really over 10% to the church. And he would do it every week and he would do it in a very private manner, but he would do it in a way that, that, was, that was easy for me to see. He didn't brag about it. Probably a lot of people at church, except the people that counted the money, didn't even know that he did it. 
and there I'm spilling the beans, but I think it's good for me to honor him in this way. He was, he was one of the most generous men that I know, and he was joyful in his generosity. He wasn't just generous to the church. He was generous towards his children, and he was, he was generous toward people. You could send him something in the mail, and he would, he would actually respond. Uh, he wasn't gullible. He was a shrewd businessman. He, didn't ever, he never went without. He always had what he needed. But he was generous with his resources. And, and he did that for, for like 50 years. And really the same church for 50 years. And I thought about all the ministry and all the, the, the lives that were changed and all the good that happened. Just... Just through the dollars and the cents that he gave. I, I did some math did this week and I thought, you know, my dad gave like, I mean, this is, tr this is true. If you do the math over 50 years, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. But like, man, he could have could have had a house in Belize or something, you know, that I would have enjoyed, right? But, but I asked him just a few months before he died. I said, Dad... Did you really, the big church word is tithe, right? Tithe, T-I-T-H-E. Did you really give 10%? I mean, I saw you do it, and I, but did you really do that your entire life? And he said, yeah, yeah, I did. And I wanted him to say more, and he didn't, so then I had to stat, keep asking him questions, and I said, did you ever stop, like, for, like, a, period, a season, like a, like, you know, like maybe a new kid was born. Or did you ever stop giving? And he said, no. No. And that, that, then he, he said, my man, if you, if you knew my dad, he's a man of few words. So I said, so did you ever, uh, did you ever think about, <laughs> did you ever think about stopping, like consider, like not giving? He said, no, son, I never did. You know, he said, he said, I, I just, I just always felt like the Lord had been so good to me. And he, he'd always blessed me. And I just, I just always found joy in giving. And, 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 and in that case, in that aspect of my father's life, he was aligned with the teachings, the, tenet of Je the tenets of Jesus. See, see, my view of waste and God's view of waste are, are not the same. Some of us, some of us here, we view waste like the rich young ruler. It would be a waste to give my money away. I have so much, that then I would have less. I would have less or I would have none to spend on myself. Yeah, and if we have that view, then, then we would be in error. But, but some of us view waste like the indignant disciples who were standing around, the, around that, that poor lady who, who, who poured out this, you know, 50 grand worth of perfume. Some of us view waste like them when they criticize the extravagant cost of anointing. I mean... If given the choice, we would say, like, none of us would choose this kind lady uh, to be our retirement managers, right? Because that's not how you spend money. That's, that's not a responsible way to invest money. You just poured it on the ground. It would be a waste to spend so much money on a gift to Jesus. We could have used that uh, to feed the poor. Yeah, right. Like, like that's really what they were thinking, Uh, <clears throat> years ago, when I was in my 20s, right out of seminary, Lydia and I were in Albuquerque, and I was working in a large Presbyterian church, and I led, I led the church in, uh, they, were a, they were like a high church in their liturgy and in their worship, and they sang hymns, and it was beautiful, and they were led by a pipe organ and choirs and handbells, and it was beautiful. It was, it was righteous. It was, it was legit. They really worshipped. And that's the style of worship that they, that they uh, 
practiced. And so they, it came time, their organ was broken and they needed a new organ and pipe organs, which like, that's a dinosaur now, but, but pipe organs, uh, they're expensive. And we, I led the church in spending, you're going to gasp, I know, $300,000 on a new pipe organ. And it's still there to this day. I'm long gone, but it's still there. It's still leading uh, people in worship to our, our Heavenly Father. But, but at that time, even then, and this was the church that was largely aligned with this. They had planned on this before I even got there. But I remember some people say, what a waste. We could give this money to the poor. And I suppose that's true in some iteration, in some way. But, but I would caution us. Uh, perhaps, perhaps you've said, you know, it, it, a, way, a new building, what a waste. That's not, that's not reasonable. Or a new sound system for worship or a jump house for the kids' ministry. Or what, why such waste? We could have given that money to the poor. And again, I question whether or not that was the, the, the real root intention. As if, as if there's some shortage of money in, in God's storehouse. And if we, if we spend it on this, then, then we won't be able to come up with more. Now that's true, there's a shortage in our own storehouses at times, but there is no shortage in God's storehouse. And so if it's a wrong, if it's a wrong thought to say, like, if I, if, I, if I give it away, then I'm going to run out. What a waste. And if, and if it's wrong to say, if I, if I spend it, on the Lord's work or on the Lord himself or on some offering to God, then, then how impractical. I could use it to, to feed mouths or whatever. Then, then if, if both of those are not in keeping with how God sees waste, then, then where do we go? Uh, see, you mistakenly think, you mistakenly think that there's a, a shortage <coughs> That God doesn't have enough. That he's a pauper. That he's barely... Do you, do, you know, do you know another word for waste? Another word for waste is... Look it up. Look for synony synonym for waste. And here's a word you'll find. Extravagance. Extravagance. What we know of our Father, of our Heavenly Father, is that he's an, he's an extravagant Heavenly Father. He is, he is extravagantly generous toward us. See, I talk sometimes, and you, because you're good listeners, you ask me, like, what do you mean about God's economy? You talk about God's economy and the world's economy. See, in God's economy, God's economy is often radically upside down by my standards. We saw it in James 4 when we studied it a few weeks ago. We see it in Psalm 1. We see it in Psalm 37. That there are these two options. We can either live by the world's standards or we can live by God's standards. We can, we can live in the world's economy and say, like, I've got I to I be careful and I can't spend too much and I can't give too much. Or we can live in, in God's economy. A third way, which is actually how James says, we, we're either friends of the world or we're friends of, of God, but we can't really dabble in both worlds. Our view of financial wisdom and God's view of financial wisdom are not the same. You have to work that out. I can't tell you like like I, like we're we're not we're not going to I wouldn't even fit. We're not going to put up $300,000 pipe organ in this space, right? That'd be silly, right? Wouldn't fit, we don't have 300 grand, and that's not how we worship. But together we have to work through these issues and say, there are times when extravagance is exactly what God calls us to. And we have to be as sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading and say, like, when I don't want to be extravagant right here, is it because I'm being a good steward? Or is it because I'm, because I'm stingy and fearful? 
And if we're open to it, the Holy Spirit will work that out in our lives. But there are matters worth giving wastefully towards. And sometimes they may be the most impractical of matters by your own standards. And Jesus may call you to that anyway. There's the last, the last big idea. It's this. I can bless a generation I may never meet through giving. Here's what I mean by that. It's, it's, it's only implied in both of these stories. It's, it's, uh, it's not expressly stated, but it's there in both stories. Sometimes our generosity, sometimes your generosity, in fact, I would say most often, your generosity uh, doesn't only reach the here and the now. It stretches into the next generation. It stretches into generations to come, people that you won't meet, not yet anyway. I'll, 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 I'll tell you how, how it's found in both of these stories. Number one, Jesus says to the, to the, uh, <clears throat> to the woman... Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, this woman's actions will be remembered and discussed. Here's the point. Her extravagant act, her extravagant gift is touching your life to this day. It's creating some angst. It's creating some sense that, that you need to recalibrate, that you need to think through what she did Thousands of years ago, 2,000 years ago, what she did is still making a difference in your life because our generosity, we can bless generations to come. She did that. Jesus points that out in the story. He says, what she did today is going to be making a difference for a long time, pouring it out on the ground. While the indignant disciples said, why such waste? So we see it in that story, but we also see it in the story of the rich young ruler. Jesus says to him, go sell your possessions, give the money away, and then he says this, and you will have rich reward in heaven, then come follow me. Here's the truth, folks. Many of you in this room in 2019 gave extravagantly to the Lord. Many of you in this room in 2019 gave in a way that was sacrificial, gave in a way that you said, like, I could have used that. Like, I could have used that, but I gave it to the Lord. And guess what? There will be people who will, who will approach you in, in eternity future and they'll say, you know, I was born in 2150. And you don't know me, but you gave some money toward a church, toward a ministry that 100, and 100 plus years later, they, they, they came knocking on my door one day and I was saved. And, and I just want to say thank you. And, and you may have people approach you that live in Peru. Or today, or living in, in, in far northern Canada, or live in Asia, and they would say, you don't know me, but I was, I was living in a different place in, in, in the world, but, but you gave, and, and, and the money went to missionaries who came to, to my neck of the woods and, and shared with me the gospel in my own language, and thank you. And, and and in ways that we can't even comprehend right now. Jesus says, rich will be your reward in heaven. We, we, we know it from this really famous pas passage. Jesus said, store up for yourselves <clears throat> treasures in heaven. Where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also, I'm going to close with this, and we might, we might pick up right here next week. Don't be confused by this passage. 
often we think wherever my heart goes, wherever my heart goes, the, that's where my money goes. And that may be true. I mean, I could, I could probably look at your, well, I won't, but I could probably look at your account and say, like, I, I can tell what you love uh, by, by, by where your money goes, flows most freely. That's true. But that's not what this passage says. That is not what this passage says. This passage says it quite the opposite. Jesus says, you send your treasure there first. And then your heart follows. If you would say, like, my heart isn't really in it, Randy. I want it to be. Like, I want to want to be generous, but my heart isn't in it. What Jesus says is, you send your money there. And your heart will follow. I love you guys. Let's pray.